Uh, thank you very much for coming. So today we're going to talk about side chains and uh, layer two, and the talk is about like how they're different, yet very similar in some ways. Uh, my name is Georgios. I do consulting and research on off-chain protocols, and my main focus on interoperability and scalability. So the big question is like, why do we want to interoperate? And this is the answer. There's a lot of currencies, like they all want to talk with each other, and if the multi-chain thesis is to like survive in the long term, um, we have to figure something out. Why do we want to scale? So I just learned that there's a talk by Joe Lubin happening right now, like when one million if devs, who cares about the devs, what about the users? So, and there's no way to get the users like without being able to scale with like quick confirmation and quick um, low fees. So let's go back to where it all started. So Blockstream released this paper, and like uh, I think it's the first time that sidechains was mentioned as a term. Turns out I'm wrong. Like this never happened. Uh, the first mention of sidechains was by Satoshi in 2010, uh, which he mentioned on Bitcoin Talk as usual, like that sidechains to do interoperability. However, what he actually was talking about was merge mining, which is a completely different technique. Um, Three years later, you have Greg Maxwell, a very prominent Bitcoin Core contributor, who describes a scheme called the Coin Witness, which was very similar, which is very similar to what people call today ZK Rollup. And then we have this guy called Killer Storm, who actually described the first like uh, sidechain construction by utilizing uh, certain types of proofs. So the two-way peg, as uh, described in the blockchain paper and by Killer Storm, describes a mechanism by which somebody locks some money in an escrow, and then via pegging transaction, you create the same amount of money on another chain, and that is a side chain. And in that side chain, you may have a different rule set, like maybe the chain progresses faster, maybe it has smart contracts, and then when you want to get your money out, like you provide a burn transaction, and then the people of that side chain, they allow you to withdraw your money back on the original escrow. And there's multiple ways that you can implement that. So like, let's dive into it. The main problem that we're trying to solve is like how we can observe another chain state and convince ourselves that this chain that we're being shown is legit. In Bitcoin, that's very easy. Work, hashes are very easy to reason about. They're quantifiable, you can do some math and you can figure out exactly how hard it is to attack. The, the trick here is that, um, however, if the proof of work algorithm is um, very expensive, like you need to be able to verify it. And uh, doing it with any fancier like proof of work algorithm, it's very hard. And you cannot verify a script, for example, on EVM. And the way that you do this is via a thing called the SPV proofs, the way that most light clients work. And there is a very close like interaction between uh, sidechains and light clients that I will get to in the, very soon. So instead of providing like the full chain, you provide the chain of headers along with Merkle proofs of your transactions. And what you're trying to convince is that the chain that you're giving is actually the longest chain. This is too expensive. This is too long. It's linear. I need to provide you like so that you're guaranteed that I'm giving you the best chain like without ever having any trusted checkpoint. I need to give you Genesis, a bunch of Merkle proofs, and you should be convinced. That's way too expensive. So there's some techniques called Nipopause the one technique called Superblocks Nipopause by Dionysus Zindros and Fly Client by Benedict Boons, who should be around this area, so you should talk to them about that. Snarks, which Barry like, alluded to earlier, and Stateless SPVs. So Stateless SPVs is another technique by James Perstitz, who's also around, and you should talk to him about it. The problem here is that um, all work is not equal. If I have the Bitcoin chain with a bunch of hash rate and a bunch of ASICs and the Ethereum chain with the GPUs and like a different hash rate, having an asset on the one chain and on the other chain, even if it represents the same like kind of like collateral, it's not actually the same. And I have developed this mental model where I want to think of cross-chain assets as alloys. So it's similar to how in chemistry like uh, you can combine uh, one uh, metal with another and get some different properties. I think that like uh, moving a Bitcoin from the Bitcoin uh, chain to some other proof of work chain, perhaps like tokenizing Bitcoin on Litecoin, for example, for faster confirmation times um, is an option. But however, like due to the difference in the hash rate, you're no longer as secure as you were before. So you can call that BTC 30. And what about the BTC X, where X can be TBTC, WBTC, you pick it. Some derivative off of the Bitcoin, which tries to peg like the price to it and it's going to be used in the DeFi space, for example. However, the assumption here changes from like the honest majority of the miners to the honest federation, for example, if you're doing a federated peg, 
or like to the whole mechanism around it working. So you have technical risk arising. So each solution has a different like trade-off space. There's no free lunch. But about proof of stake side chains. So proof of stake side chains like um, don't exist. What about proof of stake like clients? Which the argument is that it's equivalent. This is a proof of work uh, block. Many proof of work chains. Many proof of work blocks. Um, and you accept a proof of work block only if the hash of the block header plus some nonce that you change is less than a number. So let's take this and uh, switch this in the proof of stake situation. You replace the nonce with signatures and you accept like the block only if the blocks that you have received have signed like more than two thirds of stake. So how does this look like? How am I going to do a proof of proof of stake? I will pick some blocks, like every some amount of time, and I will check that each time the validator set would have changed in this proof of stake sidechain, I would verify that they signed on the latest block. This means that also, of course, it's linear because I have to give you still linear to the size of the chain blocks, and, but also the sidechain smart contract or the light client must always be aware of the latest stake distribution because how will I know that uh, who is the two thirds that I'm receiving the money from, the signature from? There's an attack here which uh, I want to call the cross-chain nothing at stake attack, which basically says, usually in proof of stake change, you have the nothing at stake problem where validators like start building on two chains, and basically if you can take the data from one chain and put it on the other, you can slash them like for equivocating, for double signing. However, what if I have a chain, like I'm a validator, I have a chain that I'm building on, and then I'm just having a hidden chain that I'm also building on, but I'm not sending it to anybody except light clients. The light client must be able to take the signatures that I gave them off, out of band, and put them on the, on the main chain. I'm not aware of any chain currently that has this mechanism implemented. Tendermint right now has a few documentation, has some documentation exploring this. They call this, if I'm not mistaken, the phantom validator, because like you're a validator, but not really, because you're sending stuff out of band. Um, the issue also with this is the long range attack. Because what if, how, like, you need to, to in order to incentive align this mechanism, um, you need to slash. How do you slash if the person that fed you with, uh, like, with the signatures is now unbonded? It's complicated. So, like, the rule that you must say is that, like, you will only accept proofs, like signatures, from people that um, are still bonded. You reject from unbonded validators. How do you know which validators are unbonded? I don't know. Like, Currently, the dominant approach is having a trusted checkpoint via, like, so that you always know what is the latest, uh, like, bonded set of validators. This is an open problem. There's many solutions. Uh, there's many other solutions that you can take, but they all, again, they all, like, tend to some subjectivity, which does not exist in proof of work. Everything so far, we assume that each chain is individually secure. If we're both, like, if both chains are secure, then sure, you can do, you can make them communicate with each other. Security and uh, like requires that you have something that is high cost. Have something that is high cost is not scalable. That has high cost is not scalable. So sidechain consider harmful. What if the sidechain like mechanism, if you try to use it for scalability, um, and if you try to use it for scalability, inherently it will be less secure. Um, does not want you to get out. So what if the liquid sidechain suddenly becomes uh, the devil and like they say, no, like your money is gone, you're done. So we don't want that. The current taxonomy that we have for sidechains then means that we have the, med the federated sidechain, which is the multisig a la liquid, liquid, the proof of work sidechain, which is with nipo pause for logarithmic uh, SPV proofs, and some reorganization proofs, because as we all know, I hope, when you have a proof of work chain that forks, like you want to be able to punish for that fork. And you have proof of stake sidechains where you have basically a, a multisig which gets rotated each time the, the stake changes during elections. Or, and you also add uh, some equivocation. And uh, the thing is that you trade always security for scalability if you want to use it that way. There is a great paper released like last week actually by Alexei and uh, friends uh, on communication across distributed ledger. Right now they're doing a workshop on it, which was very unfortunate to con because it conflicts with this talk. So make sure you read this paper. To like elaborate on, uh, to conclude on my point about sidechains and interoperability solution, it's not a scalability solution. You need an independent security model. And the moment that you have an independent security model, my argument is that you're not in the layer two domain space. It's a layer one that talks with other layer ones. It's like on the same level. 
how do we scale them? What's gonna happen? Off the chain, so Paddy McCoy is around here, like the, everything that's working on like off-chain scalability requires that you have a layer one, a layer two, and some mechanism to make them communicate. You need to put the minimum amount of data on chain, because the chain has a finite amount of space, and if you're going to support one million F devs, you're not going to be able to hold all that capacity. And maybe Ethereum 2 is gonna do it, but what if it doesn't? So, but what's layer two? So, I call it a delayed settlement protocol with layer one guarantees. So you have a protocol where you lock some money on the layer one, then you perform some off-chain operations, and then you have guarantees that are like equivalent to your layer one security model that you'll be able to get your money out. And there's two like dominant approaches right now, which is the commit chains approach, which is like what Plasma is, rollups, no cost, and they have like some certain different trade-offs, whether they can do smart contracts or not, and there's channels. And the dominant channel approach is the lightning for Bitcoin, and uh, as far as I can tell, there is some state channels initiative, which like everything merged, and kudos to them, because it was a very hard task. So, and they have like different properties, but we're not gonna talk about channels in this talk. So let's dive into the commit chains. So firstly, we had Plasma, like 2017, Vitalik Joseph, they published this paper, nothing in the paper worked, and uh, it describes basically a mechanism where you have an operator that takes hashes of the sidechain and it puts them on the layer one. But, um, and the security of the commit chain or the Plasma, like it comes under the um, assumption that you're able that any time that like something bad happens, you can take some fraud proof from the Plasma chain state put it on the layer one, compare it to the hash that was committed earlier, and you can get your money out like within some time. And it has some secondary assumption that like you, you must be able like to get your money, to get the fraud proof in within a week's time or two weeks time. So this is like a secondary assumption that very security oriented folks will argue against, but again, that's not the topic of the talk. <clears throat> the problem with the plasma construction is that um, the operator, it's at their sole discretion to give you the data. So what if they don't? Um, like you have some state, they create a Merkle tree of the state or of the latest UTXO set, they commit it, but they don't give you the data. You have a problem then, because in certain, uh, they, can they can create an invalid state transition, and this invalid state transition will never be revealed, and like you will never know that you no longer have your money. So there have been like um, changes to lately to the Plasma-like protocols to fix that. And it turns out that maybe, yes, maybe Plasma was a premature optimization. Maybe, like, many people might have raised money on Plasma on something that might be broken. What can we do? That's how technology will move forward. So how are we going to solve the data availability problem? We cannot. So what we're going to do, instead of having off-chain data fraud proofs, we'll put data on-chain with fraud proofs. And that's what we call optimistic roll-up. And this is what the, currently the Crypto Economics Lab and the Plasma Group teams are working on which is basically that you take all the data that is off-chain, you create a smart like encoding of them, and you dump it on the call data of the layer one. And that's kind of cheap, because the data is not part of the chain, it's just part of the database, like here. And uh, the other people that are working on this, like uh, another like uh, independently like um, uh, thought of construction was called Merge Consensus by Mikhail and John Adler, which basically says what I just said. You have, you commit like all, all the, um, like the Merkle root, and also you put an encoding of the transactions. And you use basically the layer one as a data availability oracle. Um, and then if you plug out the fraud proof and you put a validity proof, a ZK snark, stark, like whatever you want, whatever they call it these days, you have a ZK roller. Like, and I, I'm saying this like just so that we can get over the word salad and like understand like that the bits and pieces that make a mechanism. ZK rollup means that you have the commit the new Merkle root or the latest state or the transaction that happened, you take a zero knowledge proof which attests that this state transition is valid and you put it on chain. The smart contract verifies that the state transition was valid with moon math. The problem with this is that maybe you need a trusted setup as we saw in Snark September where like five new Snarks were like released maybe we can remove the trusted setup but I wouldn't build all cryptography that is released in 2019 and uh, they can be expensive, like proving times are expensive, verifiers are also expensive, and they can be slow. So again, no free lunch. And uh, a note on the on-chain data availability, because it has been like, um, like pumped as an idea that like, is gonna solve all our problems. I'm not a fan. 
because the blockchain is supposed to be the verification layer. The blockchain is not a file storage. Like, and Filecoin and other chains that are going to do that do not exist yet. So we know that like, this is a hard problem and maybe won't get solved. The solution, solving the data availability problem like, will give us the ability to do like, DeFi and all the other like, use cases that we're trying to figure out for this industry on the layer two, cheap and fast. But um, like, on-chain data availability reduces your scalability benefits. Like, you cannot have like, infinite throughput like, with the other layer twos. Because again, you're bounded by the layer one's capacity. So it's really a constant size improvement. And also, it's parasitic, uh, in my view. By parasitic, I mean that like, the moment that you start utilizing the chain so heavily, what about the other apps that are not on your layer two, your roll-up, or whatever you call it? Um, are they all going to come to your roll-up? Like, I think that's too like, uh, ambitious. And there is a post by Vitalik recently where he like, elaborates on this, and he's a fan about this idea, which, yeah. Some takeaways from this, uh, I, from this talk is that we know how to do both proof-of-work and proof-of-stake sidechains. It's hard to implement them. Um, you need them to both be individually secure, and having an honest majority assumption for more than one layer one is uh, hard as we have seen for multiple 51% attacks on smaller like, chains. Layer two inherits security from layer one, and like, I have a small taxonomy of like, what goes where. Um, I'm a fan of the like, direction. This is like, the current direction that we're going, it seems, um, but we should be like, uh, very skeptic about how much like, uh, we're just dumping on the layer one, because nobody can sync an Ethereum full node, and this is not going to help with it. The conclusion is, sidechains are for interoperability. Layer two is for scalability. Sidechains are not layer two. Thank you very much, and I'll be happy to take some uh, questions for three minutes. And also, yeah, I should have changed this. You can find the thought at, uh, scaling at sidechains2019.pdf. There is a microphone if anybody wants to do a question. We have three minutes of question. Hi, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, so you gave, I think, very detailed criticisms of both layer two and sidechain solutions uh, without highlighting uh, too much of their uh, positive aspects. Uh, what solutions are you actually fond of? I'm fond of the plasma construction for simple state transition for payments because this industry solves payments and uh, I'm happy like if I can get a construction that can do multi-sig, time locks, like, and that's it. And plasma does that fine right now. So plasma for? Plasma for simple payments. I, I do not care much about smart contracts, like smart contracts. Multi-sig time locks are sufficient. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the breakdown. Um, one thing that uh, you didn't talk about, which I thought would be interesting to hear your perspective on, is um, hybrid approaches for rollups. So where we use um, you know, proofs of work from other chains to make the data availability uh, there, but do the fraud proofs on another chain. Right, so uh, wait, is the question um, that I have a rollup where I don't post all the data on chain, but only for specific state transitions? So it's using um, availability from something other than the L1 that you're- No, I do not think that's good. Um, because uh, the, your security model changes wildly. The security model that I want is I have the layer one, I know exactly how secure it is. I know that I have the Bitcoin chain, it has this much censorship resistance, this much capacity, I can dump all this data. The moment that I'm going to use Bitcoin Cash as a data availability layer, which is what you're like talking about, um, means that like, I have to trust Bitcoin Cash's miners. And do you know how easy it is to censor Bitcoin Cash? Very easy, like 10% of Bitcoin's hash rate. So no, like one chain for, if you're gonna dump data somewhere, dump it on one chain in my view. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you so much.